0.0001% winds up coming back to, uh, to another spot. At some point, you just say it's converged well enough. The solution is not going to change much on the, uh, no matter how many more bounces that you do. So the radiosity solutions work by creating this giant linear algebra matrix of uh, coefficients where you say you identify all of your surfaces and you say how much can, what form factor, what fraction of the energy goes to all of the other different surfaces. And then you may be solving this 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. And there were, you know, there was a lot of work on the optimizations that you, that go into solving this more effectively. Uh, but there are two reasons why radiosity is not a, re not a particularly relevant technique for computer graphics anymore. One aspect that it sort of glossed over was the notion of occlusion, where if you've got a surface, if this goes out here and you go around the dark corner, all right, we've got this surface here. It's clear that it can't see this surface at all. Uh, it can see this surface, this surface, it can see part of this surface, you know, a fraction of it, and it can see an even smaller part of this surface over here. So you have to calculate these occlusion terms where you're saying each one, each surface, unless you're in your, you know, your deformed stretched icosahedron or some, uh, you know, surface, some uh, solid that has no convex, uh, no concavities inside it, you're going to have these, uh, these aspects of occlusion. And this becomes a very, very difficult thing to solve completely analytically. If you're trying to stay in just analytic world and you, uh, you try to solve, well, okay, we have this surface occluding this surface and then another surface here and another surface here, it's the potentially visible set problem uh, on every polygon. And it's, uh, it's an analytic nightmare. So you wind up solving this by approximating. You just say, all right, I'm, I've got a surface here. I'll throw a bunch of rays to test out here, and I'll throw 20 rays out, and if 10 of them get through, I'll say I'm 50% occluded. Now, a purist will, will start blanching and saying, well, yeah, but there's, that's random. There's this randomness. You might be misestimating. There could be pathological cases. Uh, and there's, you know, there's some truth to that. Anytime that you're sampling things, there are sampling cases that, that can turn out pathological. But the other side of that then goes, it's like, well, we're, we're tracing rays. Uh, we have another technique that involves lots of tracing rays uh, and come about it from the different route, which is to say, well, let's start with ray tracing and let's try and solve the global illumination problem using nothing but ray tracing, which leads to path tracing. So you could make a rendering solution, a rendering program where you start with your light emitter you throw photons out in all directions. You have your cube here, and somewhere you have your eye. You will get a physically accurate image if you throw random rays, pick a random direction. It goes down, some of them go off here, some of them go up here, but eventually some of them wind up hitting a surface. And then based on what that surface is, you determine which direction the light goes out. It's going to be random. And again, your, your perfect reflector would not be random. It would go off in exactly the perfect reflection direction. All other materials will throw light in essentially all directions, but with different distributions. They'll be more biased towards the reflection direction. But there'll be a chance that they go everywhere. So one of your billions of light rays goes out, hits there. It decides it's going to reflect up. Another one goes out hits here, it's going to reflect over. But eventually, some ray is going to come down, hit a point here, and then reflect at exactly the direction that goes over and hits the surface of your eye, which the lens can then focus into something that you can perceive. And this is, has an interesting biological side to it. The, the larger an eye is, the more light it can collect, which is why animals that will generally hunt at night can have larger eyes, larger openings into their eye. Uh, and why telescopes get bigger to see more. You can just, this is what's happening in reality. Zillions and zillions of photons come off, they bounce around, and eventually some tiny fraction of them hit the lens of your eye or your detector or whatever you're using and can be resolved into an image. So you can make an image like this. People have done it. It is extraordinarily inefficient. Uh, but you can solve everything with it. This is a complete and accurate, as accurate as your 
uh, as your analysis of what the light's distribution is and what the surface's distributions are. This can be as good as that. You can have your, you know, your extra surface up here where you hit the ceiling, you bounce back down, you hit a wall over here, you bounce back over, and then eventually make your way to the eye. And you start thinking, well, you can have 10 bounces going in a random direction. Your eye is only some handful of millimeters across, uh, but you're projecting an area this size. How many traces do you have to do? Well, you have to do billions and billions, and you wind up with a very noisy image at that. But if you did enough of them, this would come out with the right solution. Trace array, it either gets absorbed, or it reflects into a different way, or transmits through it. You've got this whole the model that you use, the, the bi-directional subsurface scattering uh, distribution function. So as accurate as that is, determines what happens to the lights. You can have models of the lights. There are these standards like IES light tables that have uh, you know, those particular lights. You could look up what's the distribution of photons that come off of them. You could look it up for all the different ones. And as good as the data is, uh, your simulation can be as good as, the gar as, good as what you feed it. Uh, but it's hopelessly, hopelessly inefficient. What we wind up doing in different ways that can be reasonable approximations are instead of tracing, throwing rays out from the light, uh, which are mostly going to go nowhere near what you want, you can reverse the trace and go from your eye, like in the kind of classic ray tracing, go to the surface, and then you start getting into the cases where one of the key, one of the sort of buzzwords in high-end rendering is whether a renderer is biased or unbiased. A biased renderer is not necessarily perfect physics, but it's almost, they do it because it's going to be a lot faster. Like the standard thing that you do, if you don't mind being a biased renderer, is you say, well, I have all these directions that I could go to the world. I could go up to the ceiling, I could go down to the floor, but I know I've got all of these lights up here, so I'm going to send most of my rays towards the lights because those are almost certainly going to be the things that really make a difference. So you go, you hit your point, and you tr say trace against every light. You know, you've got three lights going here. Let's run a trace up against them, check for occluders, solid things blocking it off. And then you start throwing random amounts of rays in different directions. You can be smart and base it on what the character of the surface is. Uh, and, you know, it, uh, it again, again comes down to these distribution functions where you could have rays where it's more likely that if light comes in this way, it's more likely that it's going to make it out towards your eye, so it makes sense to sample that more often. And there is tons of work going on to this day. This is sort of where the active state of the art of graphics rendering is. Where you, how you optimize this path tracing to be more efficient in different cases, but it is always then you're making your approximations on what you want to do, uh, because you can make, like the problem with this is if you have, uh, if you if you're biased and you trace specifically to certain lights, there could be uh, combinations of surfaces here. Like you might have a surface here which is slightly emissive. And if you wind up hitting that because you were tracing towards the light, that's going to get overrepresented based on, you know, versus something that's over here that wasn't in the direction of one of the lights. But this approach, you know, it pretty much works. We do, um, like for the baking in id Tech 5, we have a very primitive lighting solution because even though we do it offline, uh, we have to, the surface area of one of the maps in Rage is about as much as the pixels that go into a feature film, and we have turnaround time, so clearly we can't do these billions of ray traces for every, what would be a frame of that. We, you know, we have to keep these down to some credible amount of time. So what we do is, when we're rasterizing a surface, we don't even have the viewer at all. We're doing a view-independent approach for the global illumination. And again, the terminology is problematic because we have radiosity as terminology in a lot of places as a synonym for global illumination. And technically, it's not. It shouldn't be that way. I mean, we have a visualizer called Rad Preview, even though it, it does not do a matrix calculation for radiosity at all. It's, uh, you know, it is based on this more of a tracing approach. So we get our surfaces, we look at all the lights that we think should be affecting us, we trace to them to get the, our shadows and sample them to make soft shadows. In fact, that's another important thing. Uh, the way you get a soft shadow is if you've got a surface and you've got an object that's going to cast a shadow, if you have 
if you had a point light source, so it was nothing but a teeny tiny point that all the energy came out of, then you would have a hard shadow edge. It would look like Doom 3, um, where you just have, you've got fully illuminated and then fully shadowed. In reality, there's no such thing as a point light source. And this is an important, uh, important thing to realize. Uh, everything, even if you look at a light bulb, a dangling incandescent light bulb, the photons are actually coming out not off of a point, but off of a little zigzaggy filament that's inside that. It has an area, and the photons come off distributed from that area. Now, the sharpness of a shadow depends on the ratio of the area of that emitter to the distance that it's going across. When you have a great big broad fluorescent light assembly and you've got a small occluder here, everything is going to be lit to some degree that you have. Yeah, so in this case, you might have only the very smallest area there that would be solid, completely shadowed. But as you move over, you start to be able to see part of the light. So it gets brighter and brighter until you get to the point over here where you can see the entire light emitter. So we have, uh, to get the soft shadows in rages, uh, and, well, so like if you looked at the original, the earlier quakes, there were soft shadows in there, but they weren't a matter of calculating soft shadows. They were because we made a hard shadow calculation and then we interpolated between it, which is why you got kind of the blurry stair-steppy edges there. Uh, for Tech 5, we actually send a number of shadow samples. And this is one of those things that gets into performance trade-offs, where if a designer sets a very large area for a light source, then it will have, you will have a very broad area of changing shadow resolutions. And if you only put 16 tests to it, that means you only have the possibility of 16 bands of different lighting. And that's in the best case if it comes out exactly sort of for your samples where they do their best good. Uh, and it's, it's completely possible to have, if you've got a broad area light source, to need hundreds of samples for every pixel to determine how bright that should be. And it can get, it can get worse in a lot of cases. A lot of offline rendering may use thousands of samples per, uh, per fragment when you get into the global illumination. So what we do from the direct lighting, okay, obviously it's a biased uh, lighting approach there because we sample directly to the lights. But then we send out random rays from the surface to see what else it hits. And when it goes out and hits this surface up here, then we apply a simplified version of the lighting to that. We don't do all the full soft shadows, but we do basic uh, lighting approaches. Uh, we've had options to do multiple additional bounces, but you know, this is what we live with, is some approach of sampling the global environment. And we don't do it lots for each pixel. What we wind up doing is uh, each point throws one or a few samples into different directions. And then when we average them for this pixel, we average over a broader range of pixels. And these are the types of trade-offs that everybody doing rendering makes different trades like this, where they, uh, you decide what you think is most important, how much time you can afford to spend on things, and you kind of you make your choices and you, and you live with them after that. Uh, but we know doing it right is just a matter of throwing billions of rays in an ideal case. You have to throw lots and lots into the environment. We can make decent approximations now, but I, we're going to soak up all the additional computing power that can be given. Like one of the saws in the offline rendering world is that I, you know, the frames will always take a half hour to render in most studios. The more power they get, just the more things that they add to it. Uh, there's hope that, that that's not a law of nature, that, uh, that we are getting to faster turnarounds, kind of like the pace of hard drive, uh, hard drive size versus usage. But it does seem likely that the path forward is lots and lots of rays, physically accurate material uh, definitions, and approaches that are approximations of the sampling of path tracing. We can do there are some neat demos going on, uh, going around today, uh, like the Brigade path tracing demo, which is real time, uh, and it's doing simple path tracing from sort of a parallel outdoor light, and it's, it's noisy and fizzly as it comes in, but you can stop and watch it kind of come in more crisply. And eventually, this is going to be the way things go. Uh, this is the way we're going to be rendering, but we still have uh, 
you know, maybe a couple orders of magnitude before it's really competitive. I think one more order of magnitude in performance and you'll start seeing it used for some real things, but it's still, you have to have a good reason to step away from rasterization. But probably when we get two orders of magnitude, then you start seeing it as one of the more general tools. And the reason that it's winning in the offline world, even though it's still slower, people still care about how long their renderings take, even if you're making a, a feature film or a TV commercial, it matters for your iteration time. But the, the sense is that you get more out of this being understandable. With rasterization, environment maps, shadow maps, there are all these knobs that people just, the, the best people know what they mean, but 90% of the people working in visual, uh, uh, in computer graphics, you know, they, they have these things that they know push this this way and it kind of does something, but it's a lot of black magic and a lot of things that are just not at all physically plausible. And this is one of the things that I've been working with the artists at id in the last several months to start moving us towards this more physically based sense of things where if you just use your standard diffuse specular roughness, you can have materials that just make no sense at all in the real world. You can have things that reflect more energy than come in when you've got a bright diffuse and a bright specular. Um, and there's the, the real step that we've had to make education wise is treating these maps not just as something that you paint in Photoshop, but how you define the materials that are there, where it shouldn't be that if you're looking at something that's a belt buckle, you say, okay, this is metal, it's going to have a high specular, it's going to have a low diffuse, the specular may have color in it, it's going to have a high power or a low roughness, depending on how you're formulating it, because that's what it is. But far too often in, you know, for the past decade in computer, in games especially, uh, the maps that have been fed into these things, the diffuse maps, specular maps, whether they're gloss or roughness or whatever you term it, uh, they're things that are painted in where a lot of times you'd see a specular map where, yeah, you take your diffuse map and you kind of monochromize and maybe color shift it and you stick it into the, uh, into the specular and you wind up with things that, it, yes, it makes parts of it shiny and parts of it not shiny, but some of these things, like I don't actually think that there is a physical material that exists that has a red specular reflection color. Uh, I mean, maybe there is, but it's certainly not common. You know, specular colors are, are generally white except for metals, uh, which can be the color of the base surface. Uh, so there's, the biggest thing that's going to be happening for making games look better is really not advancing the graphics technologies, at least for our studio. It's the, uh, it's the matter of getting materials that actually make sense. And once you're there, then you can start improving, you know, improving the things that you do with adding your better global light transport, uh, all the other cases there. Uh, one more thing before I cut out from the time warning here. Uh, so the, the cost of all of this, billions and billions of rays, one technique that has, that's gotten a lot of currency in recent years is uh, ambient occlusion. Now, to explain what ambient occlusion is, it's another one of those great big hacks, but it works, you know, usefully, and it's used, it's kind of standard fare in a lot of offline work. So if you have a, uh, you know, an object that's got some concavity here, and you've got the light, you know, shining on it from here, so you light it all up, in an ideal world, you'd be doing all of this path tracing, and you would say that, okay, some of the rays hit here, they bounce here, they bounce around into here, some of them go up here, hit here, and get into that. So the path, the tortuous path that light can take to get into there, that's what you really want to, to deal with. If you've got your white surface there, you might need to take, trace 10 bounces from thousands and thousands of things. The observation that ambient occlusion is based on is that when something has other things very close to it, it is very likely to be uh, not as bright as things that, that do not have things next to it. If you've got a flat surface and you're lit, you know, there's nothing that's going to be bright that's taking anything away from it. But if you have a flat surface that, you know, has an occluder here, this area right here, it might be directly seeing the light uh, and it might be seeing everything in this part of the hemisphere, but part of it's going to be hitting this. And some of that may be going and seeing the light, some of it may be bouncing in different directions. So ambient occlusion, all it does is instead of sampling the whole world, it samples just a small area around the point that you're working with. Uh, and importantly, and perhaps even more importantly than the scope of what it's sampling, when it hits things, it doesn't worry about the surface model. It doesn't run uh, you know, a BRDF or BRSSDF, whatever, 
Uh, all it does is say either I hit something close or I didn't hit something, and maybe look, keep track of how far away it is. And if you get something like this, where, okay, there's some light coming in here, I can see this, but I trace out, and 90% of everything around me is hitting something else sort of close. So based on that, I'm going to darken it down, uh, just on the assumption that if I did run a global illumination uh, trace through all of this, that it would come out and say that I'm not as bright as something that's next to me that's, you know, that's open. So something out here, that'll get the full value of whatever it calculates, and as you move towards here, some of it's starting to, to get darker until you move all the way in here where almost all of it. And it's, it's a very, very crude approximation of just assuming that whatever it hits isn't going to be bright. And you can break that by having air cases where, you know, if you had, if the light was coming in right here where it's directly illuminating all of that, and if that was a white surface, you could have more light coming down onto there rather than less. Ambient occlusion would say, it's got nearby things, it should always be less, but you could actually be getting more light from the global illumination in those cases. You know, it's just one in a long line of all of these approximations that we do. But the takeaway point is, we know what we should do. We know what we, we would do if we had infinite computing power to go with it. So all of the things now are approximations onto it, ways that we can model our data, ways that we can reduce our number of traces, and optimizations in the code paths to make things go faster. And there's lots of work going on with GPU accelerated ray tracing, again, some of the caustic graphics work for optimizing it in some other ways. Um, and there's lots of active research going on about what corners can you cut. Uh, and it's interesting because, again, we know what the right way, zillions of photons coming out, collect them all at your, the lens of your eye and sort of make an image from that. But it's going to be research for the coming decade or more as we kind of work out what the very best approximations for this are. So I ran a little bit over my one hour, but I can start taking questions now. So we've got the microphone there. <laughs> Up until about maybe five to seven years ago, there was every year an obvious increase in uh, realism in offline rendering for especially movies. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, since a lot of the things that you've mentioned here have been around for uh, as long as I can remember, mm -hmm. I mean, Povray and all that, mm -hmm. decades ago, um, what is the main driver of that increase in in visual fidelity or realism in yeah. the more recent years? So a couple factors. One is uh, actually getting smarter about the materials, where these uh, you can throw in all of this light transport stuff, and if you don't have good materials for it, it won't matter. You'll still get non-realistic images. So better data collection, some of the laser scanning, and the different things that let us get really good material qualities, that's been one factor. But probably the biggest factor has just been people being willing to throw that much more processing power at things. I, you know, to go ahead and instead of letting these early cases where it could take days to render an image, that's never going to get used in production. And all you do is see, you know, see some of the images in like academic research. And the problem with that is, while some of the academic research would get the formulas right, they wouldn't have the data right to go with it, where if you've got, it's kind of like programmer art, if you wind up with uh, you know, the, the programmer or the graphics researcher uh, building the test scene for it, it's probably not going to be a particularly good model of the world. It's going to have too many spherical cow simplifications in it, and it just won't be... Uh, like what you go to a movie studio and they'll get all the grime and the nicks and uh, the dings and everything that that make it feel like a real lived in real lived in world. So I think those are really the two things: materials and then largely getting it into the hands, making it reasonable for the people that are going to put the level of craft and detail that it needs to represent the world, making it feasible for them to use. Is that your motivation uh, for educating the artists at ID to make it? Well, I actually think it's necessary. Realistic. I think that it's I. Uh, if you're not getting with physical rendering now, you're going to be left behind as an industry. Uh, there's, and there's been big, it's been interesting watching the offline world where you had sort of the, the masters of their domain at Pixar. They, because they had the very best in process and technology for a long time, they were sort of stragglers to adopt many of the things with ray tracing and physically based rendering. But, uh, you know, they've come around for the most part now, still using the right tool at the right time. But, uh, I can't think of many good arguments for not using physically plausible materials. I don't think that there are artistic gains to be had by not doing it, and there's all sorts of minefields where you can mess yourself up. Thank you. Uh, 
the, the very latest versions of OpenGL support pixel and, tech and uh, fragment shaders. And one of the things that I'm curious about is why you don't use procedural graphics and procedural geometry more than you do. OK, so procedural, uh, procedural graphics has been the, you know, the wave of the future for the last 20 years. And yeah. I think that I, I actually have a fairly strong uh, and sound argument philosophical stance against this, where in the end, procedural data is, uh, is quirky, hard to deal with data compression. And one of the things that we are continuing to get more and more of is space, you know, the storage that we can get for things. So while you can always pick out some niche market where you're, you are going to be extremely constrained on, uh, on your space, and you'd think, well, mobile should have been maybe the space where procedural stuff comes into its own, but you know, that's ramping through all of the storage spaces uh, for everything that it's really not. You know, all the standard methods are going on. So uh, it's not a particular, it's a good tool for making programmer art, but uh, when you want to put it into the hands of the, the, the people that are going to, mo if you're modeling the real world, you laser scan everything. You go ahead and say, I'm going to scan this room and I'm going to have a terabyte of data and I'll just render that as some enormous point cloud. And that's, that's credible even. It's not, we can't ship a game like that yet, but that's still within sight of something that we can do. And if you want to give it to an artist to create something, then they're largely going to be compositing together different things. And procedural sources, yeah, you use them for your clouds and your smoke and particle, things like that. But uh, you know, this, was, this was Pixar's cant for a long time about doing, you know, they would create with, uh, with procedures, analytic procedures rather than textures. And that way lost. It was really pretty conclusive that nobody wants to do that. They want to throw 20 layers of effective painting on top of things. And you can still come up with use cases for it, but it adds a lot of complexity uh, for, you know, for a win that outside of poster child cases really isn't there. Okay. So uh, for your offline rendering, have you ever considered using progressive photon mapping techniques? And have you ever had a chance to talk with uh, Henrik Juan Jensen about any of that? So I wrote uh, a photon mapping version for our, our system. And there's an interesting, a really interesting aspect to this where, uh, so a fundamental aspect of global illumination is that there's no difference between a light emitter and a light reflector, where you have to look at saying the photons that come off of this surface are just as good as the photons that come off of that light. Uh, and when you, when you calculate through, when you make a photon map for something, you figure out how many photons you're going to send into the world, uh, you create a map of them, and you uh, use that as an accelerator for determining your, your uh, global illumination solution for each point. The problem that I ran into was, while that works fine for a, a single sort of character of a scene, for an indoor scene, uh, I found photon mapping to be pretty effective in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, you still have all the problems of uh, where you wind up setting things, bleed throughs in some cases, and they're, but they're manageable problems. But when I ran some numbers and I realized that uh, if you're calculating an outdoor area, the amount of light that falls on like one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, just holding it out in the sun, all of a sudden that surface has all of the photons, the same amount of photons that come out of a 100 watt incandescent light bulb. And you start saying, well, we have acres and acres of surfaces out here. And of course, we're, you know, we're scaling everything down so it still fits with, well, I completely did not get to any of my output, monitors, gamma correction, all that stuff. I, I, so I mean, we, we have all these hacks to kind of normalize it, but I found it to be, I, in a, in a situation where you had a bright outdoor area and then a dimmer indoor area, you had to have so many photons in the outside to make the, di the dim one come out reasonably that it became pretty prohibitive. The other reason that we don't do photon maps is that it, it requires a sequencing where the, the nice thing about distributed ray tracing and the, the path tracing uh, in its purest form, it's completely embarrassingly parallel. Any surface can be done at the, any time because we run on multi-threads, you know, multi-core processors and multiple systems in a cluster. And if you want to do something with an intermediate step, like a photon map, you have to build the photon map in some hopefully parallel way and then transfer it to everything else. And we had, my very first global illumination solution in the early days of RAGE was GPU accelerated, and I rendered little hemispheres on the GPU and built up a, uh, I built up a low resolution mega texture of the world and used that for global illumination, which is, it was uh, reminiscent of a photon map. And it was 
it was just one of those things that in practice turned out to really be kind of a pain. And when we went to a, a completely separable solution, a lot of problems stopped happening. Uh, you know, but I, I, it was interesting implementing the photon map stuff, going through a few of the cases. It's certainly a valid direction right now. But I think that the, uh, uh, in a lot of cases, the, the necessity to generate